Joseph Smith as president of the United States would be focused on making sure the government worked for everybody, that everybody benefited from the, the, the work of the government, that everyone's rights and freedoms were protected by the government. Welcome back to For All The Saves podcast, and uh, I'm honored to be speaking with Spencer McBride today. Spencer, thank you for coming on the show. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, Spencer, I I'm going to get straight into it um, with the question, because obviously you you've written a lot about uh, Joseph Smith, his presidential run in particular, in your fantastic book. Um, what might a Joseph Smith presidential administration have looked like or, or what how might that have impacted america yeah it, it's a really interesting hypothetical question um because the chances of joseph smith winning the presidency were, were slim to no but he did put forth this really interesting provocative platform that a presidency of that joseph smith as president of the united states would be focused on making sure the government worked for everybody, that everybody benefited from the, the, the work of the government, that everyone's rights and freedoms were protected by the government, uh, which was the whole reason Joseph Smith ran, because um, Joseph Smith felt after appeal, after appeal to the federal government, specifically to the United States Congress, for redress and reparations for the expulsion of the saints from Missouri, under threat of extermination, and he got nowhere. And he was told that the federal government could do nothing for him. And so he saw that change was needed. So I think Joseph Smith, as president, as a hypothetical as the situation would be, um, would have been a reformer. He would have been reforming the government and the laws to make sure that they worked for all men and women. And what what were some of his specific uh policies that he was running on? Um, you know, prior to the American Civil War, the the Bill of Rights, which is famously the, the first 10 amendments of the United States Constitution, did not apply to the individual states, meaning Congress, the president, the Supreme Court could not enforce freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and so forth on individual states. It was up to each state to do that. And that changes after the American Civil War, but Joseph Smith was on the vanguard of those calling for constitutional change long before the American Civil War. And so that was at the heart of his um, campaign platform was to make sure that the federal government could, in fact, protect the rights of people when states failed to do so. But Joseph Smith was more than a one, uh, one issue candidate. He called for the end of slavery. He wanted all the enslaved men, women, and children in the southern United States freed. And he came up with quite a, a unique um, plan and proposal to do so. The federal government would purchase the freedom of every enslaved man, woman, or child. Therefore, the enslavers would be compensated, um, but it would bring about the end to this terrible institution of race-based slavery. He called for uh, banking reform. The United States was going through constant cycles of booms and bust, and they were extreme booms and extreme busts. And he wanted a new national bank that would smooth out the economy, that would work for the people and not make a few select people exceptionally wealthy. Uh, he called for criminal justice reform. Uh, this was a time when large penitentiaries were just kind of getting started in the United States. And he saw them as more punitive than reform-minded. Yes, there needed to be punishment for crime, but the criminal justice system, as Joseph Smith saw, it should be more about reforming the men and women convicted of crimes than punishing them. Because if you simply punish them or the prison system was weighted too heavily toward punishment, the result tended to be a permanent criminal class. So Joseph Smith called for greater investment in schools and seminaries of learning, and less in prisons. He wanted um, pretty radical criminal justice reform for the benefit of society. And, and then, of course, there were issues that he was calling for, the territorial expansion of the United States. There were ongoing border disputes between Great Britain and the United States over, like, Oregon, for instance. 
And so he weighed into those issues. But I think ending slavery, criminal justice reform, financial reform, and uh, constitutional reform were kind of the four main planks of his his platform. Right. He um, it's it sounds sometimes I'm trying to give sort of a, a similar comparison to today in terms of people who who run who are quite you know interesting and the things they say are thought provoking but they're very unlikely to get into an office and I, I sort of think of uh, Robert F Kennedy Jr. is running at the moment and you know on on the right you see people like Vivek. Ramaswamy, you know, making headlines and, and even in the past, you know, they had, um, was his name Evan McMullen or someone like that who ran from Utah. And I, I'm thinking you watch them and they are, uh, disruptors in the political atmosphere and in the presidency, sort of asking bigger questions of those above, but also very unlikely to get in. Uh, but everyone knows about them and they have that influence. And so, I mean, would Joseph Smith running because of obviously a lack of social media and technology and all of that, would he still have had that same sort of influence that we see those disruptors who run in modern times? That's a really, uh, that's a really interesting question. I, I think in the history of American politics, no third party candidate, as we've called them, has ever gotten even remotely close to winning the presidency. The closest is Theodore Roosevelt, who, after having served a term as president, later tried to regain the presidency and because of a split in his party, ran from a third party position, but, but again, wasn't that close. The next closest was Eugene Debs, who was a, a socialist candidate uh, and won a million votes while he was in prison, but still that was nowhere close to winning the presidency. So, so no third party candidate has ever even essentially seriously challenged for the presidency. And, and Joseph Smith fits that bill. It, it would have taken some type of di divine intervention, some type of miracle for him to win. Um, but he was serious, and he sent out uh, hundreds of electionary missionaries who canvassed the entire United States with his political pamphlet and preached politics. And it's really interesting that they spoke to a lot of people and some people took him seriously, but the mainstream tended not to. Um, yet, they did wrestle with some of his ideas. So, for instance, you had anti-slavery groups uh, on the East Coast of the United States that, yeah, they weren't taking Joseph Smith seriously as a candidate. Um, but in their newspapers, they began to consider his um, platform, his plan for ending slavery. Um there were people that were for uh, the rights of free laborers, um, and they started to engage with Joseph Smith's ideas. There were people in favor of banking reform that engaged with Joseph Smith's ideas, not taking his candidacy seriously, but his, his ideas were entering the political conversation of the country at that time. Um, so, so again, we see that with third-party candidates in American history. They rarely challenge um, to, to win, but they can push the conversation one way or another. Mm -hmm. And I suppose in the context of all of the many people who have ran for the American presidency, um, Joseph Smith's run was probably quite, looking back at it now, quite an obscure one amidst all of the very famous runs. But was there... In the following decades from that run, was was there any sort of residual effects from it or uh, any sort of contributions to American politics early that you could attribute to Joseph Smith? Yeah, uh, I don't think there are. And, and this may be like kind of an inside uh, backstory to a portion of my book that I think is a little bit funny. So, so my book is called Joseph Smith for President. Um, the Prophet, the Assassins, and the Fight for American Religious Freedom. And my publisher and I went back and forth on that subtitle. And they kept on, you know, when they're titling books and, they're, and publishers are thinking about subtitles, they're thinking about how can we best sell this book? How can we entice would-be buyers to purchase this copy and read it? And so they want something that promises some really exciting story. And, and I get that. But they kept on coming up with things like Joseph Smith for president, 
um, the forgotten campaign that paved the way for American religious freedom. You know, all these kind of triumphal sounding subtitles. And, and ultimately I had to just say, look, guys, this is an important story, but we have to understand that his, his, his political activity failed. He did not succeed in reforming the government. He did not succeed in ending slavery or criminal justice reform. And, and so I think in part because of his assassination and the main body of the saints moving to what was, became Utah territory, his political legacy really kind of ended with his assassination, except for two ways that I would point out. Latter-day Saints, long after Joseph Smith had died, continued to publish um, new editions of his campaign pa pamphlet. I think in part because it spoke to the constitutional problems they were still working under. They wanted the federal government to protect their rights. Joseph Smith had been a long advocate for that. Um, and so even in the 1850s, years after Joseph Smith had been assassinated, new editions of, Joseph, of General Smith's views on the policy and powers of the government of the United States continued to be published. So for Latter-day Saints, they held on to his ideas uh, even after he passed away and used them in their own political engagement. The other one is more quixotic. Um, in May 1844, a month before Joseph Smith was assassinated, um, Charles Francis Adams, the, the grandson of, of the famous John Adams in American political history, and Josiah Quincy, who would, uh, was the son of the, the president of Harvard University, would soon thereafter be mayor of Boston, they visit Nauvoo almost on a lark. They're on this great tour of the Western United States. They stop in Nauvoo. They spend a day with Joseph Smith. Fast forward several decades and Josiah Quincy is in the twilight of his life and he's writing a book from his journal about all the fascinating Americans he had met over his lifetime. And the last chapter of this book is about him meeting Joseph Smith. And he is fascinated by Joseph Smith. He doesn't believe Joseph Smith's religious teachings in the slightest, but he marvels at this man who can bring people together, build cities, and maintain order in those cities. He's, he's fascinated by Joseph's kind of outside-of-the-box thinking. And he points out that Joseph Smith had an idea to end slavery that more prominent men would come up with uh, on the eve of the American Civil War. But Joseph Smith had it a full decade earlier than these men. And, and Josiah Quincy laments in the aftermath of this bloody war be between um, the North and South of, of the United States, that if we had listened to Joseph Smith, if we had listened to men like him with these ideas to end slavery before it led to war, um, the country would have been better off. And so, so yeah, the Latter-day Saints continue to hold on to his ideas, but they're kind of far removed from the mainstream of the American political circles. But it's Josiah Quincy, decades later, who's just kind of reminiscing and saying, hey, we should have listened to Joseph Smith on his plan to end slavery. <laughs> That's so interesting. Uh, coming back to what you said at the start of that, um, why, why did you choose to write the book on Joseph Smith for president. What was the motivation behind that? So I had long been interested in this kind of quixotic campaign, right? Like Joseph Smith ran. I knew that since I was a child, I'd never fully understood why I listened to a really rather poor lecture on the topic when I was an undergraduate from a, a well-meaning professor who didn't fully understand um, American political history. And, and, and so I started just kind of as a hobby researching and thinking about this topic with no intention at first to write a book. Uh, when I was finishing my, my doctoral program in history, my dissertation first book was on the political activism of American clergymen during the American Revolution. And then I started working on the Joseph Smith papers. And it always said that my second book was going to be on Joseph Priestley and Thomas Paine in exile in the United States after the French Revolution. That was going to be book number two. But working on the Joseph Smith papers, all of these 
Joseph Smith political documents kept coming to my desk every single day. I was working with Joseph Smith's political documents. And finally, I said to myself, there's an opportunity cost here. The book I need to write now, the book I'm best positioned to write in this moment is about Joseph Smith's presidential campaign. And I think I have something useful to say here because it's one thing to talk about it as a quixotic episode that, hey, Joseph Smith tried to be president. He didn't make it, but here's some interesting ideas. And, and I think that by itself would have been deserving of a book, but I wanted to say something bigger. What about those who don't really care about Latter-day Saint history, who in religious terms might not care about Joseph Smith? Why should they care about this presidential campaign that had no chance of succeeding? And the answer I came up with in my research that I thought was worth writing a book about is Joseph Smith's failed presidential campaign illuminates the obstacles to universal religious freedom that still exist to an extent today. So... Joseph Smith ran for president because he believed the United States was falling short of its celebration of religious freedom. Americans love to celebrate their freedom, and it's a good thing, but sometimes they do it in such generalized, unnuanced terms that they think either they're the only ones with freedom in the whole world, which isn't true, or that their freedom is at such exceptional levels that they say we have religious freedom and they overlook the, their fellow citizens who don't have religious freedom. The Latter-day Saints in, in the 1800s did not have the full protection of their religious freedom. And so what Joseph Smith's campaign shows is that, yeah, we have religious bigots, and we have religious bigotry, but sometimes there are political and systemic um, con contributions to the lack of religious freedom that otherwise well-intended people are, are unaware of. There are people that would never discriminate against their neighbor on religious terms, but they unwittingly support a policy or a set of laws or a candidate um, that in effect have a discriminatory impact on these men and women. I, I hope that makes sense, right? right? These are people that would never say something unkind or deny their, their neighbor who believes differently than them of, of some right or privilege, but they support a policy or a set of laws or a candidate that has an effective discriminatory um, aim. Mm. Yeah, no, it totally does make sense. And I, I suppose then is that the, the great combination between uh, profit and politician is, is the view on religious freedom? Because I have always slightly being confused at why Joseph felt it necessary as the prophet um, to enter that fray of, of politics rather than sort of um, another member going yeah. up and doing it. But was that really fundamentally why to be the bastion of religious freedom? Yeah, absolutely. So the Latter-day Saints had been expelled from the state of Missouri under threat of state-sanctioned state extermination. Now, we hear this story so much that maybe we can kind of become immune to just how horrific that is. A state said, you have to leave our state or be subject to extermination. That is horrific. Oh, yeah. Joseph Smith and his, his fellow church members go to Washington, D.C. in 1839 and 1840, they meet with the president, um, Martin Van Buren. They meet with Congress. There's a hearing in Congress. And I don't think these men actually had prejudice towards the Latter-day Saints, but they all pointed to laws and policies and constitutional interpretations that said that the federal government could do nothing to ensure their freedom. And so to Joseph Smith and his fellow Latter-day Saints, they're saying, well, what is the point of the Constitution? What is the point of the Bill of Rights? What is the point of all our celebrating our quote-unquote exceptional level of freedom if a group of religious minorities can be expelled from a state under threat of extermination and the larger national government says, we can't do anything? And so Joseph Smith is essentially saying, hey, we're all for religious freedom, but like news alert, hey guys, we don't have it. At least some of us don't have it. We need to 
make some fundamental changes so everyone can have religious freedom. And that's at the heart of Joseph Smith getting an, engaged in politics. I really do not believe he was a natural politician. I don't think he was a particularly gifted politician. Um, he got into politics out of desperation to protect the rights and lives of his people. And, and, and you know, there's lots of politicians in any country where people vote that say, I'm not in it for the power or the influence. I'm in it to serve the people. And the vast majority of them really are in it for the power and the influence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really believe that Joseph Smith was sincere when he said he's only doing this because his people need to be protected. I, I really believe that's the only reason he got in, involved in politics. Is there any evidence you've found about Joseph Smith maybe not being as gifted a politician that... Or is that just sort of from the the results of the campaign? Yeah, so it's it's really interesting. In the state of Illinois, um, one of the reasons the Latter-day Saints had as much power early on in their existence in Nauvoo is because the state itself was really divided politically. So in the United States, you have a two-party system. You've had occasionally th third parties, but really there's two parties that dominate. At this time, it was the Whig Party and it was the Democrats. And they were almost equally divided. And so the Latter-day Saints move in as a large group who tend to vote the same way because they're voting for the people that will protect their interests, protect their rights. And they essentially take this kingmaker role almost instantly. They are a minority, but whoever they vote for wins because the rest of the state is equally divided between the two parties. And so the Latter-day Saints have this real opportunity to make friends with one of the two parties. And, and people are gen tend to be okay with groups voting as a block as long as they vote consistently and predictably. But when you vote inconsistently or unpredictably, then you draw <laughs> the ire of both sides. And that's actually what happened with the Latter-day Saints in 1843 Joseph Smith promised one side the Latter-day Saint vote, uh, or he promised them his vote, and it was implied that that would include the Latter-day Saint vote. Um, but the day before the election, Hiram Smith said, I, I actually think we should vote for this other guy. And the, Saint, <laughs> the Saints do that. And they thereby frustrate both parties. Both the Democrats and the Whigs are mad at them from this point on. And, and in fact, the, uh, the governor of Illinois, Lilburn Boggs, in his kind of memoirs and his history of Illinois, reflects that this kind of botched block voting in 1843 is when a certain amount of Illinois citizens became determined to chase the Latter-day Saints out of their state. And so Joseph Smith wasn't particularly astute at navigating the political landscape. Um, it, this wasn't his natural tendency. I don't think he wanted to be a politician. Uh, he, he would have been content to just teach the gospel to his people and live amongst his people in peace if they'd been allowed to. Um, but he was forced into the political fray. And, and, and he came up with some really important, beautifully articulated ideas that you read in his pamphlet. But in terms of playing hardball politics... In a, in a political landscape where they played hardball politics, Joseph Smith was uh, not necessarily predisposed to do that well. Hmm. I, I've I've done a, a little bit of work here and there in politics myself, and and uh, not directly, but sort of I, I made lots of events, live talk events, and things like that. And, and uh, yeah, I was surprised at how cutthroat sometimes it is. You know. I, you see it on the TV and you think it's theatrics in some sense, but then, you know, you're, you're having conversations and thinking, Ooh, <laughs> yeah. that was really sad, not in front of an audience. And yeah, yeah. very strange. But I suppose it's, it's not unusual in a way when we look back, uh, uh, you know, profits being involved in, in politics, you know, when we think of that, we think of Joseph Smith's run, we think of uh, Ezra Taft Benson being in the cabinet, but, you look back and and you see the role of like Lehi, Jeremiah, uh, Isaiah, um, even, even King Benjamin and, you know, the reign of judges. We've always had that prophetic voice in scripture quite often um, standing up for one reason or another and 
teaching these things. So I, yeah, I guess that's not that unusual after all. Uh, but I wonder when we talk about Joseph Smith's martyrdom and his assassination, if you were to put a percentage on how much of that assassination was down to uh, Joseph Smith, the presidential candidate versus Joseph Smith, the prophet, what would it be? Yeah, I would. This is the way I've phrased it because Joseph Smith has the unwanted distinction of being the first American presidential candidate assassinated um, during his oh, really? campaign. Yes, except oh. there's an asterisk next to it because he wasn't he wasn't killed because he was running for president. Um, it, the politics were involved in the martyrdom of Joseph and Hiram Smith. But they weren't national politics. They weren't presidential politics. Um, Joseph's harshest critics in Nauvoo saw him as holding too much political power and religious power at once in the city of Nauvoo. So it was Joseph Smith as mayor and Joseph Smith as prophet at the same time that gave considerable concern to um, the, his harshest critics in the state. And so politics were involved, but not presidential politics. No one was, as far as I can tell, was trying to assassinate Joseph Smith because he might become president of the United States. Um, they saw it instead as this combination of religious and civic power that should not exist in the United States, or at least shouldn't exist among a religious minority group in the United States. That that was, was the key, because others had kind of combined religious power and political power before, but it was one thing for a Protestant to do that. Um, it's when a religious minority was doing that that it became a problem. Right, I, I see. That makes it. That's been a a question that's on, been on my mind for a while. Is is uh, that distinction? So that's helpful. Um, now, speaking about something you mentioned stuck in my mind earlier, which is you know, the issues that Joseph was facing with religious discrimination and religious freedom are to some extent still around even today, um, whether systemically or, or d directly. Um, could you take us through perhaps an understanding of what you feel is the current state of religious freedom in the world or, or maybe specifically uh, America where you are? Yeah, I, I think it, it's a it's a really important topic, and and we see kind of two levels of urgency depending on where you live. In, in the United States and many other democratic countries, um, we're still fighting for universal religious freedom. Um, we're still fighting against bigotry and discrimination. Um, but generally speaking, I think the trajectory is going the right way. Latter Day Saints are not hounded by mobs anymore um you know things have gotten better for latter-day saints in the united states for instance and, and other countries where they may have been treated poorly by mobs but in the united states still we see discrimination against muslims we see discrimination against um jewish people we see a lot of bigotry still present in society which isn't exactly the same thing as religious freedom right religious freedom has more to do with laws and government um, people can be bigoted and prejudiced, but be relatively powerless with that because of, of the, the laws that exist in the country. Um, but, but we're still fighting those. We're fighting those throughout the world. We're fighting that type of bigotry and prejudice and discrimination in the United States still to this day. But I like to think that the trajectory has, is going the right direction. It's not a, it's not a steady upward trajectory, but the overall trend, we're getting better but we have to stay vigilant. We have to keep pushing. And until every single person has religious freedom, we haven't really accomplished religious freedom. Now, internationally, the picture is a little bit different in countries that maybe don't have a democratic form of government or that have laws that still discriminate against people of different faiths. Um, I'm thinking of of several places where um, Muslims and Jews and Christians are still legally discriminated against. Um, and, and in some cases face violent persecution condoned or carried out by government forces. 
that is a very real issue. It's a very real problem and it's being addressed and needs to continue to be addressed. And, and, and I believe strongly that it deserves the attention of people everywhere. It's one thing for you to say, well, I feel like I'm protected in my freedom uh, in my country, but if we really care about religious freedom, it means we care about it for everybody everywhere. And so, so I think it's a pressing issue. I think Joseph Smith and the Latter-day Saints give us some really valuable historical lessons about how to approach these subjects in the present. And what I hope is it gives Latter-day Saints um, a level of empathy and a desire to work for religious freedom given our own predecessors past experiences with discrimination and persecution yeah that's a really important point and i i totally agree that this should be more pressing of an issue and and you know people in wards i'm, I'm seeing in the uk having served in in communications in some areas there are so many people latter-day saints doing good in terms of religious freedom it's really inspiring to see and I served my mission in a place where you spoke of, you know, uh, where people of certain religions are legally, uh, systemically, deliberately, uh, don't not on equal terms with with some regards, uh, or disadvantaged because of their religious status. So uh, I've seen that firsthand, um, I, and I wonder also. I mean, we saw during COVID, Elder Bednar spoke quite powerfully about the uh, sh the shutting down or the curtailing of the freedom to worship in a way, you know, the freedom to gather. And, and there's a debate there between whether or not that was uh, right or not, but maybe it shouldn't have come from the top and been mandated. I, I don't know, but I, I had an opportunity in the UK to speak to the health secretary at the time. Um, and based on what Elder Bednar sharing, I asked him about the, you know, why, why were so many things deemed as essential that, you know, weren't that essential, you know, going to the pub, uh, in the UK, whereas you couldn't visit with an ecclesiastical leader or, or members of your faith. Um, you couldn't go to church and he gave kind of a ridiculous answer. It, w it was pretty shocking to hear. And that just put it all into perspective for me. But what do you think about that? Yeah, you know, I, I think COVID was really tricky, right? Because people were trying to find the best ways to protect the public, public health, and we wanted to be good citizens. And, and I think the church was very, was a model citizen in cooperating with local governments to figure out whatever way we could still minister and, and, worship together um remotely if need be to 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 keep our worship and our faith alive and well but also protect the health of of the whole of society but of course there's disagreements on exactly how to do that to what extent should policies be put in place um and and what groups should be deemed essential what groups should not I mean, I completely understand the difficulty in those in those discussions. I, I look at how, how our church operated in COVID and, and I feel a sense of um, of pride, maybe the good type of pride. Right. We're like, I'm proud that yeah. our yeah. our church leaders were good global citizens. They tried to be really good global citizens and cooperate with the goal of keeping worship services going, but also protecting the health of the public. And so I don't pretend to be an expert at that type of public policy, but I'll, I'll say, I think there usually are solutions that can help all parties. If people are willing to give a little bit to protect what's most important to them. Um, one more thought, if it's okay, as, as I'm thinking about this bigger picture of religious freedom in any one country, but also internationally is, is one of the most um, significant early documents on religious freedom written in the Western world was John Locke's A Letter Concerning Toleration. Uh, he's writing this in England and, you know, there's still some prejudice that Locke has that's very evident toward certain groups. But he makes a point in there that I, I have 
latched onto since I was a college student at university thinking about these things. And John Locke essentially makes the case, I'm paraphrasing here, that faith needs to be a choice. Religious faith needs to be chosen by any individual. And if any government or any law gets in the way of individuals being able to choose their faith, um, we're essentially hurting faith in general, right? Faith should never be coerced or forced or guilted. It needs to be chosen. And so if there was ever just a basic religious principle, I think that would fit any religion is that faith needs to be chosen. And if for no other reason, we need universal religious freedom so people can choose their faith. And to me, beyond politics, beyond policy, beyond law, that basic idea that men and women should be able to choose what to believe um, is, is fundamental. Mm -hmm. And it, I mean, I've met people personally and, and taught people who um, have fled countries because of this uh, limit on their choice. You know, I, I taught someone who... Uh, just love with all my heart and and his father was killed um for not denying his faith um and he was threatened likewise which is why he moved and i just think meeting someone in real life uh in my privileged state where i you know if i want to convert to whatever i'm free to do so you know and i won't be uh I won't be persecuted because of it. Um, likewise, I can remain in, in my faith, and that's what I in, intend to do. But just to meet someone face-to-face -face who has gone through that uh, just brings it really home what Joseph Smith was doing in his presidential run, you know, um, because it's it's kind of foreign to us today. It is foreign, but there are people today who had the same experiences similar to what Joseph Smith and all the Latter-day Saints were facing then. And, and when I picture the guy that I taught, uh, then it makes it all more real f for me. But uh, I wanted to move sort of onto a different trajectory, which is uh, your work on the Joseph Smith Papers Project, which uh, seems to be an incredible work that's being completed. Um, and I, I just wondered if you could perhaps share with us some of your favorite insights or stories that you, or experiences that you had or learned during that project yeah it it has been a tremendous opportunity the the highlight of a, a career that's still going right i'm still relatively young in my career i have decades left to go but i i, I can't imagine what is going to top a decade of work on the joseph smith papers when it's all said and done for me um i was hired right out of my doctoral program i had finished my doctorate in history in May 2014, and the very next month, I started working on the Joseph Smith Papers Project. I moved my family to Utah, and we've been living here ever since. And how old are you, Spencer? I, I'm 40. To just looking at the <laughs> the work that you've done and the two fantastic books that um and stuff and these projects it's, it's incredible. Congratulations. Well, thank you. That's thank very you. kind. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I'm more tired than 40, but that just depends on the day. Um, but yeah, I look at this and, and I joke sometimes when I give firesides to different groups, I say, you know, what do I do for a living? I read dead people's mail. Um, <laughs> and, and specifically, I read Joseph Smith's mail. And you learn a lot about somebody when you read their mail. And I, I always give the caveat, of course, don't go rooting around your roommate's, you know, personal effects. But um, it has been a privilege to be a historian who's going through Joseph Smith's surviving documents to learn more about this man who I believe with all my heart was a prophet of God called to restore the gospel of Jesus Christ in its fullness. And when I read his documents, when I think about the, the past decade I've spent immersed in his documents, there's a few lessons that really come front of mind. One is Joseph Smith's sincerity. No, I believe Joseph Smith was a prophet, but so did Joseph. Joseph had a sense of humor and he might make jokes occasionally, 
but he took his prophetic role very, very seriously. And he was dedicated to it. And, and a lesser man may have given up after the expulsion of the saints from Missouri under threat of state-sanctioned extermination. But Joseph Smith was dedicated. When he wrote in his history, uh, I had seen a vision and I knew it and I knew God knew it and I could not deny it, nor dared I do it. Um, that was Joseph Smith. He felt that and he meant that. And you read his surviving papers and there is no doubt about his sincerity and his commitment to the gospel of Jesus Christ and his role as a prophet. I also noticed how messy the process of the restoration could be. Joseph Smith did not walk out of the sacred grove, as we call it today, with a step-by-step -step guide of how to restore the gospel, how to restore the church. He was led a little bit at a time. He learned line upon line, precept upon precept. He was allowed to make mistakes. Um, and God would teach him when he made these mistakes. Joseph Smith got to learn how to be a prophet the same way we today in the church learn how to be Sunday school presidents or elder scorn presidents or relief society presidents or bishops. Joseph Smith was no different. He got to learn how to be a prophet. Um, our prophets today still learn how to be a prophet. Now, granted, because of their time in the Quorum of the Twelve, generally, before they're sustained as president of the church, that learning curve is, is not as steep as it was for Joseph Smith. Um, but Joseph Smith got to learn. And, and so there's a messiness in church history that is real. And for some, it can be off-putting because we've learned this very neat and orderly story of how the church and the gospel were restored. And so it can be off-putting for some when they encounter some of the messiness. But for me, um, my faith has increased. My testimony has become stronger because I see what God is able to do with an imperfect group of people and the miracles he's able to perform if they are willing and if they are humble. And it's no different for us today. I look around my ward and I see a group of people that I love and we are weird and we are, you know, have our personalities. There's the guy who, whose temper is maybe a little bit too short. There's, there, there's, the, there's the guy who's maybe too willing to gossip. There's the person that falls asleep in church. There's the person who makes comments that are entirely too long and rambling in Sunday school classes. Right? We have all these personalities in the church that make us kind of quirky and unique. Well, that same combination of personalities existed in Joseph Smith's day. They existed in Kirtland. They existed in Nauvoo. God was working with the same imperfect mix of personalities then that he is now. And so to me, the imperfections and messiness of church history isn't a cause for doubt. It's a cause for faith and it's a cause for hope that God can still work mighty miracles through us, not despite our imperfections, but maybe um, because of our imperfections, if we are humble and if we are willing. I'd say the last thing that I, there's so much that I could share about my time on the Joseph Smith papers, but maybe the third lesson that really stands out and it's personal for me, is the balance between an intellectual approach to church history and a spiritual approach to church history. I firmly believe that God wants us to be smart. God wants us to think. God wants us to ask questions about our faith. He wants us to understand what we believe and why. But I also firmly believe that God wants us to feel our faith. He wants us to feel as part of our discipleship. He wants the Holy Spirit to testify to our souls. And we need both. We need the thinking and we need the feeling. Um, but if, and I can say this as an academic, I think I can say this without anyone thinking I'm anti-intellectual or I'm telling them not to think. That's not what I'm saying. But if you had to choose just one, it should be the feeling. It should be letting the Holy Spirit testify to you. Now, God doesn't make us choose just one. 
But one thing I worry about as both a historian and a disciple is when someone's discipleship becomes purely intellectual, becomes purely academic, he or she is missing the most important part. And that is the feelings and promptings and communications of the Holy Ghost. And so as a scholar who studied the messiness of Joseph Smith's life and of the restoration, I have all sorts of questions. I have so many questions that I hope to find answers in this life, but if not, you know, I don't know how it all works on the other side, but may, maybe there's like a Q and a session where I can go with my list and, and have Heavenly father explain why this happened and that happened and this happened. But my questions don't become doubts because I have those spiritual experiences and I seek new spiritual experiences. So maybe that's a long winded rambling answer to my time on the Joseph Smith papers. Maybe I missed the mark of what you were hoping for, but I think it's an appreciation of Joseph Smith's sincerity and commitment. It is a, um, a, an admiration or sorry, an understanding and an acceptance of the messiness of church history and admiration of what these imperfect men and women were able to do. But then also thirdly, a, a sense of the need to balance intellectual, uh, the intellectual with the, the spiritual in our respective discipleships. There are so many things that you've said in, in that response that are just, I've never thought of it before, you know, even just, simple things of of how Joseph was learning to be a prophet similar to how I would be learning to serve in, in my calling and things like that just really put it into perspective, you know, and help me to think about it in a good, in a more healthy way, you know. And that's, I always feel so inspired when I speak to um, church historians, uh, the, the ones who are supportive of the church. I'm, I'm not as inspired when I <laughs> speak to the ones who have it out uh, but just uh, Stephen Harper puts it as being a seeker, having the mindset of a seeker. And I think just that skill that you all have, or is it a skill or, or just, you know, the mindset that you have, just it transfers so nicely to so many other facets of discipleship uh, of that being a seeker, whether it, I spoke in a recent episode about the word of wisdom and and that seeker mentality came into my mind again of of uh, the attitude of seeking to think, how can I care more for my body with these promises and all of this? And I love that approach, especially in this time when there are so many upsides to having so much information about church history. But the downsides that, you know, many of us have struggled with who aren't sort of uh, good with history and, and things like that is is people take it out of context and present to you a piece of information and go, here's a dead cat that is almost when you take it out of context, seems quite dark sometimes. They can package it in a way to make Joseph Smith look really dodgy in, in some cases. And it's hard to grapple with those with a, you sort of go into fight or fright mode because it, fight or flight, because it means so much to you. Yeah, and I think the antidote to to that kind of intentionally skewed um, and and critical view of of Joseph Smith, the type that try to tear him down, isn't necessarily. You know, we might think that the answer is to hold him up as having made no mistakes, right? But but but, but I think really the antidote to that is understanding him in the full context. As you mentioned, the context matters. And I, I think, you know, church members who are a little uncertain about where to go for a good um, scholarly accurate approach to church history, but one that won't try to tear down their faith. I think the the soon to be four volume history of the church called Saints um, oh, yeah. is a really good place to start because that's built, that first volume is possible because of the Joseph Smith papers. You go through the citations, you can look at every single source there. Um, but something else I've, I've taught, you know, I've, I've given talks, I gave a devotional address at Enzyme College last year. It was, it was a thrill for me to talk to them. 
And I talked to them about the five things that I would recommend someone do if they're feeling besieged by doubt. And no one is saying, don't worry about it, at least not anymore. I hope they're not anymore. There was a time when someone maybe had a question or concern about church history, and someone might say, don't worry about it. And, and they meant well, but th that wasn't really the right approach necessarily to it. Um, people have questions. It's okay to have questions. It's okay to seek answers to those questions. The key is seeking good sources. And what I mean by, what I don't mean by good sources is only things published by the church. Now the church has published and will yet publish many great and wonderful things for the edification of the saints, especially regarding church history. What I mean by good sources is there is a difference between a source that is trying to tear down faith, to destroy faith, and one that is trying to explain and clarify, right? You can have a source that's not saying, believe this, but is trying to give an honest um, uh, and, and unbiased as possible approach to history. Those are the sources we need. And you can tell the difference. You can usually tell the difference between a source that's trying to tear down faith and one that's trying to clarify and explain. And so when I say seek out of good sources that doesn't, I don't want people to hear if it's not published by the church, we shouldn't, we shouldn't read it or listen to it or engage with it. That's not what I mean. But you know, there's a lot of organizations publishing about church history that are doing really good work, helping people understand complexity and context and to do it without trying to tear down or diminish faith. That's what I mean by good sources. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. And the saints is brilliant. I, I, I think I read the first volume, like in a, in a number of days, it was, it was such a page turner. Um, so interesting. So many things that I never knew, uh, that sort of, uh, enhanced my understanding of church history. I'm wondering, based on your book, uh, Pulpit and Nation, where you talk really interestingly about the uh, role of the Protestant clergymen in, in sort of bringing the religious underpinning of America today. How, how can we be like those people in our world, which is sort of becoming increasingly secular, uh, quite dark some, in some places as well, um, increasingly sort of further and further away from God. Uh, how can we emulate what those brave people did in coming over to America and, and uh, bringing it back to Christ and forming that foundation of religious freedom? How can we impact our society today in a similar manner of bringing people back to Christ? Yeah, this is a really important question. I don't know. I, I think if I had a really simple answer to it, I would, uh, I'd probably be up for some type of like peace prize or something. I'm not sure, but, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but, but I think about it a lot because one of the flip, we talked earlier about religious freedom. One of the trickiest parts about religious freedom um, it, it's easy in the abstract to say, yeah, everyone should be able to believe and live according to their beliefs um, as they desire. But when it comes to making laws and policy in a, in a country, especially a democratic country, um, it can be difficult to make the space necessary for people to believe differently than you or to not believe at all the decision not to believe is as protected by religious freedom as the decision to believe. The basic idea is that no one's faith is coerced. And that's not just the type of faith that's faith at all. Um, we can't make people believe in God because that violates religious freedom. And this gets really tricky when it comes to the administ administration of government and laws. Because if your laws are based too squarely on one group's preferred set of, of morality, it could cause feelings of prejudice or discrimination among another group that believes differently. So, so the task that's really tricky in any country that has religious freedom or is striving for religious freedom is how do we set a, a, 
a system of laws that matches a shared sense of morality. And, and that is really tricky. I don't know if I know the exact answer to that. But the answer is not to forget morality. Our laws need to be moral. Our interactions need to be moral. I think the most important thing any individual can do while we figure out this kind of generational problem, uh, I should say multi-generational problem of religious freedom and making and enforcing laws when there's conflicting views of what's moral and what's not, is that in our interaction, we live morally. In our interaction with our fellow citizens, we treat them as Jesus Christ would treat them. We are kind to them. It, it doesn't mean we allow people to roll over us. It doesn't mean we become pushovers. But we find ways to be Christ-like in all that we do. Um, we look to government a lot, and, and in many cases we need to. But I think reestablishing a, a fundamental sense of morality in our society begins with each individual and it begins with each family. Um, as cliched or elementary as that may sound, if everyone is trying to be like Jesus, for instance, our society is going to get better overnight. If people are taking their family responsibilities seriously and teaching their children the difference between right and wrong, and teaching them to stand up for right even when it's unpopular, our societies are going to get better pretty quickly. So maybe the answer at the government level is a lot more complicated and, and I don't know exactly what that is, but I think the answer at the individual and family and social level is actually pretty simple. Um, live a good moral life. Now we may have different, different people may have different religious beliefs and some different senses of what makes a moral choice a moral choice, but there's actually a lot of similarities between all the faiths of the world. There are some pretty obvious agreed upon points of morality, no matter what your faith is. And if we can focus on those and we can treat each other with respect and Christ-like love, um, I'm convinced that that's the most important and easiest thing each individual can start doing today. That's brilliant. Thank you, Spencer. And I totally agree. Uh, I do think morality begets morality in, in many senses, similar to so many other things. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much for your time today. And I mean, what are you working on at the moment? What are you working on next? Uh, yeah. So we have so much in the works in the church history department. Um, yeah, people, if they know what the church's church history department is, they might even know the Joseph Smith papers. They maybe know saints. But we have so much that's coming out. Um, our department's been publishing the the discourses of Eliza R. Snow, an early Latter-day Saint woman and, and former president of the, the Relief Society. Um, we have a lot of work going on on global history, telling the story of Latter-day Saints all over the world. We want everyone to be able to see themselves in their church's history. Yes, this kind of Joseph Smith era will always be important. We will always talk about it because it's fundamental to understanding the restoration of the gospel. But it's really important to church leaders and the church's historians to make sure that every church member around the world can see themselves in church history. Uh, and so you're, you're, you're going to see a lot of stuff that's at work right now that's going to grow, be published soon about global church history, increasing our efforts in that regard. Saints has done a lot in that regard, but you're going to see even more. One of my current projects right now is working on a new volume of Joseph Smith's religious teachings. Um, different volumes have existed from time to time and have done a really good job of kind of compiling Joseph Smith's doctrinal teachings. Um, Joseph Fielding Smith's The Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith is perhaps the most iconic of those works. And it served the church really well for almost a century. But now that we've published the Joseph Smith papers, now that we have a sense of all that was is there, um, that, that book, as 
remarkable as it is what Joseph Fielding Smith put together, um, doesn't quite get at all of Joseph Smith's religious teachings. So we're working, we're in the early stages, so you know, nobody hold their breath or start checking Amazon today, but we're in the very early stages of, of compiling a new teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. We, we, don't have a, we don't have a title yet, but, but that's essentially what it is. That's, that sounds great. I look forward to that <laughs> when, whenever it happens, if it happens. Uh, and are you writing that book about Thomas Paine? <laughs> Slowly but surely. Again, I said it was my second book. I think yes. it's, it might be my fifth. We'll, we'll, we'll see. I, I, whenever I have some spare time, I tend to pick up a new biography of Paine or another collection of his writings. Um, maybe before I retire, that book on Thomas Paine will be out. We'll see. That can't be a bad thing that you're too busy to write. Uh, to write, <laughs> you wanted. You're in too much demand. But yeah, thank you so much, Spencer. I really appreciate your time. Oh, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks for watching. For all the saints, this show needs your help to grow. Please like the video, comment your thoughts subscribe to the channel and share this with someone you think would enjoy it. Thank you.